So data science uh, has some major concepts that are present there. Uh, number one is called data wrangling. And if it sounds like I'm roping broncos, and when I say wrangling, that is pretty much what we're talking about. Um, and the reason for that is because data in the, in the wild is not straightforward. You think of data, you think of like an Excel spreadsheet with clean data with like values that make sense and things like that. But in the real world, if we're, if we're talking about using data science to understand the world around us, it's a little bit crazy, right? Even if I gave a survey to just you students in this class about your hobbies, and I had 10 questions on that survey, I might get all kinds of different answers from you. Now, of course, some of you would fill out the survey exactly the way I intended it and give, give me the response that I was looking for. But other people might be like, mm, that question number three, I'm uncomfortable with that. So I'm just going to skip that one. Or maybe you get halfway through the survey and your computer crashes. And so even in a very controlled environment with just a few of you responding to a survey, what I would get is data that's kind of crazy. It doesn't make sense. It's not uniform in the way I would want it to be. And so data wrangling is a whole process of basically asking what happens with the data that's incomplete? What happens with the data that doesn't fit our mold? Because what you do with data that's incomplete affects your end results. If I say, you know, four out of 10 of you didn't answer question number three. So in question number three, I might have said, rate your favorite hobby from zero to 10 with 10 being it's really fun and zero being I just kind of like it. And if, if four out of six of you, 40% of you didn't answer that question, what do I do with those surveys? Do I throw those surveys away? That's a bummer because it's like half of my data. Do I just ignore those non-values? Do I say everybody who didn't answer, I'm just going to put a five for them? Or do I put a zero? Or do I put a 10? Like, what do I do with the incomplete surveys? And that's just one question with a very simple answer. But you can probably see how that would affect things because if 40% of you, I give the value 10 to, all of a sudden, if I average those 10 responses and include those four fake 10s, then my, then my average goes way up. If I put zero, then the average goes ways down. If I put five, it could still have that kind of impact. If everybody else put zero or one or 10, it still affects the data. But if I leave them out, then I've lost 40% of my data. So data wrangling says, how do we deal with that kind of stuff? So that's what data wrangling is. Statistical analysis, sort of self-explanatory. It says, how do we use statistics to look at these numbers and get a basic understanding of what's there, what's going on with these? And I'll, I'll show you some of that. Machine learning is sounds pretty crazy. It sounds like I'm teaching robots, and it sort of is like that. But there's a really simple explanation for what machine learning is, and I'm going to show you that. I'm actually going to show you some machine learning today using Python. But machine learning is basically just, it's not really teaching a robot in terms of teaching a machine how to think. It's more like training a puppy how to sit up. It's much more like that than anything scary or advanced or I'm I'm sure when we, whenever we think of AI or we think of machine learning, a lot of the visions that maybe some of us have are things like, you know, all the movies where the robots take over or the Matrix or something crazy like that, when in fact, it's really quite simple. It's just like teaching a puppy how to do a trick. So predictive modeling is something that we do uh, that sort of goes hand in hand with machine learning. And that's kind of the idea of what we want to be able to do is once we teach a machine how to understand data, then we can ask it all kinds of what if questions. If it says, here's, I've studied this data, 
then we can say, well, machine, tell us what it would look like if this was true or if that was true. Predictive modeling allows us to make very, very educated guesses as to what could happen or different scenarios using data. And that's very useful. Um, my son-in-law actually works as a data scientist for a nonprofit that helps stand up charter schools here locally. And right now, one of the things he's working on is should we build another charter school in a specific part of town? And so what he's using is student success data, demographics, all kinds of things. And he's putting these into a, a model, a data model that can tell him if we build a school at this exact location that serves these students around it, here's the impact that it will have on student success in Bakersfield. So you can get really complex and it, it includes maybe even hundreds of different factors and numbers and, and pieces of data that you feed into a machine that you've then taught how to think about these things. And it can give you a model of if, if we do this, if we build this school, this is how it will impact our local area. So it's really kind of interesting and important work because obviously building a school is a multi-million dollar investment in a community. If you build it in a place where it's not gonna have an impact or where it's not needed, that's not a good thing. So he's helping make those kind of big decisions. Uh, data visualization, you've probably done some of this with, with even your basic math. It's charts and graphs. It's a way of looking at data and seeing what's going on in an illustrative way. So it allows us to use a different part of our brain to understand what's going on with data. And you know, if we're looking at big data sets, data visualization is really, really useful because we can, a picture's worth a thousand words, right? So a picture of data allows us to see some interesting things that are going on. It's way easier to see trends and, and the shape of data in a visualization than it is by looking at the raw data or even a summary of the data. So data visualization is something that we're gonna talk about um, on Wednesday. And I'm actually gonna show you some tools for making some really outstanding looking charts and graphs. Uh, in fact, so good that you may abandon even using Excel in the future. Uh, because these are really cool, really interactive charts and graphs that you can use. You can even put them into other presentations or whatever. And then big data just refers to the, the amount of data that we're using. We're not, we're not talking about 10 surveys. We're talking about hundreds of thousands of surveys or hundreds of thousands of clicks on a website uh, and how we can, how we can make sense of that kind of data. And in fact, that data of that magnitude gives us such a clear picture of user behavior that that's why the algorithm at YouTube and Facebook and Instagram and TikTok, that's why that algorithm is so good. And it feels like, man, it really knows what I'm into, right? It's showing me just the right cat video or just the right this or that or whatever. and it's kind of funny because the algorithm at Instagram, obviously my daughter just, just had a baby a month ago and she's been sending us all of these cute little baby videos and memes and stuff. Well, all of a sudden my whole Instagram feed is just babies. Um, but, but I also, I, it's working because like I want to watch the cute baby videos all of a sudden. So it knows, it knows what I want based on what I'm doing. And that's not from a few users, right? That's from billions of videos being watched all day, 24 seven. That data is just streaming in. And they're, they actually, the algorithm is processing that big data and making it useful for us. So those are all big ideas in under the data science umbrella. And we'll get more into some of those than we will the others because some of them are just more than we can cover in, in a class period. But I am gonna hit on many of those things. We have a lot of tools for data science. Um, these are the primary ones that we're gonna be playing with. Jupyter is a way of running Python scripts 
in a web browser window that allows you to save the results in a notebook-like format. They're actually called Jupyter Notebooks. And Jupyter is really, really great for playing around with different things in Python, especially though in data science because you can view the results right with your code and you can save them. I'm gonna show you a Jupyter Notebook here in just a little bit. So Pandas is one of the primary tools for analyzing data. Pandas is sort of the standard for dealing with large data sets in Python because it allows us to simplify things like data cleanup, manipulation. It allows us to work with data in a fairly intuitive way uh, and, and it gives us a lot of great shortcuts. So we'll use Pandas a lot. The other thing that Pandas is really good about is integration with everything else. So when we're using Pandas, we can integrate it with all kinds of other tools, not just these, but literally hundreds of others. Uh, MathPlot Library or MatPlotLib is, is a way of visualizing data. It is more popular than some of the others. Um, it, to me, it feels a little old school. I don't like it as much. And so the one I'm gonna focus on when we use data visualization is called Plotly. Matt Plotlib has some good things and it will, it will create static images for you. Um, Plotly, on the other hand, actually opens up your web browser with the chart in it. And every chart in Plotly is completely interactive, meaning you can change values, you can turn off different pieces of the data. I'll show you that on Wednesday. But Plotly, to me, is just sort of the gold standard when it comes to creating uh, visualizations.